All right, we're going to talk about um, natural resources and intangible assets. And you'll find those in what they call Section 2 and Section 3 of Chapter 8. So here in Section 2, we talk about natural resources. These are assets that are physically consumed when they are used. Examples would be timber, mineral deposits, and oil and gas fields. Um, these assets uh, are going to end up in our inventory for us to sell once we have cut it, mined it, pumped it, whatever the process is it has to, to be done for it. But until that conversion takes place, the natural resources are non-current assets and they're shown in our balance sheet under titles that make sense for that particular company, such as timberlands or mineral deposits or oil reserves. Um, the way that we account for these natural resources is that when we originally purchase, we recorded it cost, and that would include all expenditures necessary to acquire the resource and to prepare it for its intended use. And then each year we record the what we might refer to as depreciation, but when it comes to natural resources it's called depletion. We record that each year. And the depletion is the process of allocating the cost of the natural resource to the period when it is consumed. So it's just like depreciation of a, of a, a piece of machinery or a building, but it's what we do for natural resources. So the natural resource is then reported on the balance sheet at cost, less accumulated depletion. Now depletion is usually done based on the number of units that are extracted. And this is similar to what we talked about under depreciation for units of production. In this case, this is the units extracted. So here's an example. If you have a mineral deposit with that you've purchased with an estimated 250,000 tons of available ore. Now this is important because you, you have to estimate this. You have to come up with what you think you're going to be able to extract from that particular field that you have purchased. So in this case we have 250,000 tons that are estimated. It's purchased for $500,000 and there's expected to be no salvage value. So in order to figure out the depletion charge, we have to figure out how much per ton. If we paid $500,000 and we think there's going to be 250,000 tons extracted, that equals $2 per ton. Obviously 500,000 divided by 250,000 tons. If 85,000 tons are mined and sold in the first year, the depletion charge would be 85,000 times 2 equals $170,000. And then in this chart here, you see how they came up with that. Then the entry that you make from an accounting standpoint is depletion expense, 170,000 debited, and accumulated deple depletion is credited for 170,000. If your mineral deposit was originally recorded at $500,000 in the books, and you've now used 170,000 of it, the balance sheet would record a, a, a balance of $330,000. Now that's what happens the first year. Now, in this case, this example they gave you, all of the 85,000 tons that were mined were sold. But what happens if you still have some of this left at the end of the year? You've mined it, but it's sitting in inventory waiting to be sold. In that situation, you have to use an ore inventory account. So, another example, 40,000 tons are mined, but only 34,000 tons are sold. Well, the 34,000 times $2 is $68,000 that you're going to record to depletion expense. The other 6,000 tons times $2, which is 12,000, is going to be put into inventory. So we debit the ore inventory account. The credit is still the same. All of it goes to accumulated depletion for $80,000. So that's 40,000 tons times $2 is 80,000. Now, sometimes uh, in order to, well not sometimes, probably most of the time, when you are converting these natural resources by mining or cutting or pumping, it requires machinery and equipment for you to do these things. Those are also plant assets. Remember from what we talked about just in the last lecture. 
So when the usefulness of these plant assets are directly related to the depletion of a natural resource, we depreciate those plant assets based on the units of production method in proportion to the depletion of the natural resource. So if the machine is permanently installed at a mine and 10% of the ore is mined and sold in the period, then we depreciate 10% of the machine's cost in that particular period. So keep in mind that it may, if we're mining a natural resource, then it may affect how we handle the depreciation on the equipment that's used to convert that natural resource. We're now going to talk about intangible assets and this is going to be a very brief discussion because this is definitely a topic that is better served in more advanced accounting courses, but this will at least give you an idea of what an intangible is and the accounting issues that are involved in dealing with them. First of all, an intangible asset is a non-physical asset. That's why it's called intangible. And it's an asset that, con that confers on an owner long-term rights, privileges, or competitive advantages. Examples are patents, copyrights, licenses, leaseholds, franchises, goodwill, and trademarks. So these are things that bring value to a company for various reasons, but they don't have a physical substance. So you have to figure out how to account for them in your books and how to determine their cost and how to determine what periods to charge that cost to, which is referred to as amortization. So when you record the intangible asset to begin with, you record it at cost when you purchase it. Intangibles are then separated into those that have limited lives or indefinite lives. If it has a limited life, it's easier to deal with because you can allocate its cost systematically over its useful life, and we use the straight line method to do this. But if it has an indefinite life, meaning there's no legal contract that says this is good for five years or a patent that says it's good for a certain number of years, then you don't amortize a, a, an intangible asset that has an indefinite life. But as I said, if it's an amortization of an intangible asset that has a limited life, it's similar to the depreciation of a plant asset. But again, we only use the straight line method when you're dealing with an intangible asset. Now, we put the gross acquisition cost of the intangible asset on the balance sheet, but we also keep a record of the accumulated amortization, just like we keep a record of the accumulated depreciation on a plant asset. So we list the value of the asset, the value of the intangible asset under its own asset account, but then we also have accumulated amortization that shows how that cost is being attributed to different periods. The eventual disposal of that intangible asset means we have to remove its book value and its amortization uh, from the books. Now, many of these intangibles will have limited lives because of laws or contracts that are involved in it. So, as I've already said, patents, copyrights, those kinds of things will have a limited life. But things like goodwill or a trademark, um, coming up with their useful life is not always easy to determine. The cost of intangible assets is amortized over the periods expected to benefit by their use, but obviously can be no longer than the asset's legal existence. Goodwill can continue indefinitely into the future, and so therefore it's not amortized. One thing that you do have to do with an intangible asset that is not amortized is to test it annually for impairment. Impairment means that that intangible asset has been dis 
I'm sorry, diminished in value. And there's reasons why that happens, but it cannot always be easy to identify. Um, this is definitely an area that is something that we would do in more advanced courses, but at least we've introduced it here. You put intangible assets on the balance sheet, usually right under the plant assets. And in this next part of the discussion, we're going to talk about these types of intangibles that we may encounter and how we go about recording them in our books. The first type of intangible that your book discusses are patents. And a patent is when the federal government um, grants the exclusive right to the owner of the patent to manufacture and sell a patented item or to use a process for 20 years. Now if you purchase a patent, then the cost to acquire those rights is debited to an account called patents. And then if you have to engage any lawsuits to successfully defend your patent, then you also put that cost, the amount that you paid for those lawsuits, into the patent's account. However, cost of research and development are not um, put into the patent account, but they're expensed when they actually are incurred. Um, this gives an example of a patent's cost which is amortized over its estimated useful life. So if we purchase a patent for $25,000, its useful life is 10 years, then each year we would amortize one-tenth of its cost. So we would debit amortization expense patents and credit accumulated amortization patents for the $2,500. So accumulated amortization is a contra-asset account, just like accumulated depreciation or accumulated depletion. Copyright is another type of intangible. It gives the owner the exclusive right to publish and sell a musical, literary, or artistic work during the life of its creator plus 70 years. Obviously, the useful life of a copyright is probably much shorter than that. So the cost of a copyright are going to be amortized over its useful life, not over this long period plus the 70 years. The only identifiable cost of most copyrights is the fee that we pay to the copyright office. But if that fee is immaterial, if it is really a very small amount, then we can charge it directly to an expense account. However, if it, it, if it is material, then we're going to amortize that um, cost over the life of the copyright. So we would do the same thing as we did up here. We're going to debit amortization expense and credit the accumulated amortization. We also have franchises and licenses. Um, we've all seen the McDonald's and the Pizza Huts on every corner. Um, these are franchises so it's the, there are rights that a company or government grants to some business, to some person, to deliver a product or service under specified conditions. So the cost of a franchise are going to be debited to franchises and licenses, an asset account, and you're going to amortize that over the life of the agreement that you have with McDonald's, Pizza Hut, or whatever. Another intangible are trademarks and trade names. I'm going to let you read about that here and how we handle that. And then the other one that's really difficult to know how to deal with from an accounting standpoint is goodwill. The definition of goodwill is pretty simple. It basically means the amount by which a company's value exceeds the value of its individual assets and liabilities. So if you took everything they own in and put a price on it and said, well, this building's worth this much, this equipment is worth this much, so on and so forth, you would come up with a, a value for that company. And goodwill is when somebody purchases that company, how much the what they purchase it for exceeds the value of its individual assets. And why would you pay more than the individual assets? Well, there are reasons for that. Maybe they have superior management or they have a great workforce. They have a product that nobody else has in, in that particular market. So it's often that people pay more for a business than what the actual assets add up to, such as Google bought YouTube for $1.19 billion dollars. 
And out of that whole thing, most of it was attributed to goodwill, not to the actual assets that YouTube owned. So $1.13 billion was put into goodwill. Amortization of goodwill is different for financial accounting and tax accounting, a whole other thing which is too complicated to get into in this class. But goodwill is recorded as an asset and we do not amortize it. Instead, goodwill has to be annually tested for impairment. If impairment is considered to have occurred, then you have to record an impairment loss. But again, this goes well beyond what uh, we're going to be learning in this course. Then there's leaseholds. When you lease property, the leasehold ref grants uh, rights to the person leasing. And that leasehold is an intangible asset for the person who's leasing. Now, if there's no advance payment, but it just requires monthly rent payments, then we don't have to set up what's called a leasehold account. We can just put that directly into a rent expense account. But if there is an advance payment, then that advance payment is going to be debited to a leasehold account. You also may find that the person who's leasing the property does leasehold improvements. And this is where the person leasing pays for alterations or improvements, such as partitions, paintings, storefronts, things like that. And the person leasing, the lessee, will debit those costs also to a leasehold improvement account. Because you're not going to get to keep that. That's going to revert, you know, it becomes part of the property and reverts back to the person that's leasing the property to you. But you can amortize those costs over the life of the lease or the life of the improvements. If you do that, you would debit amortization expense leasehold improvements and you would credit accumulated amortization leasehold improvements. And this talks a little bit about other intangibles that you might encounter, but again, this course. Um, and has to stick to the more basic uh, types of intangible assets. The only other thing that I want to mention in this chapter has to do with this particular ratio. A company's assets are important in determining its ability to generate sales and earn income. So managers spend a lot of time trying to decide what assets a company has to have how much it should invest in those assets and how to use those assets most efficient, efficiently and effectively. So one measure of a company's ability to use its assets effectively is total asset turnover. And we calculate this by taking our net sales and dividing by our average total assets. So the numerator, the net sales, would be the net amounts that you earn from the sales of products and services. And the denominator is going to be the average total resources devoted to operating the company and generate, generating sales. So they give you an example here of two different companies and what their total asset turnover is for years from 2007 to 2011. The problem is, is that what do these numbers mean? And the only way to really evaluate this is to compare it from year to year, but also to compare it to competitors in your particular field. So like in with the Molson Coors company, you know, they you see a 0.28 figure here for 2011, but the question is, is that good or bad? It's safe to say that all companies desire a high total asset turnover, but what is high for a particular industry? And then down here it tells us that in this particular industry, most of the competitors are in the range of 0.5 to 
So in this case, Moore's, I mean, Coors is not doing well because they're, they were at almost 0.5. They were 0.49 back here in 2007, but they've been much below that since 2007. So the conclusion would be that they have to improve in this aspect of total asset turnover. But again, without comparing it to other competitors or even from in your own company from year to year, the number by itself doesn't really tell you very much. But you may be asked in your homework to use this particular ratio of total asset turnover, and this is how it is calculated.